we're going to start with facilitator notes for yellow card class. Here's a little bit of background on this class. We started with Outcome Camp because we knew that teachers needed support in the whole notion that they should take these different curricular items, bring them together into integrated units. And as we traveled through the district and talked with teachers, it was pretty clear that was a challenging thing to do. So we started with Outcome Camp. Well, the problem was some of our teachers were really, really good at the content part of the GVC and others were not. So remember, there's four parts to the GVC. There's the content, the 21st century skills, the world-class outcomes, and the four C's. Teachers have to be able to navigate all four areas. When we did the outcome camp class, all holistically, like we started, teachers really struggled. Not all, but some really struggled with the idea of content and we had some pretty challenging yellow cards that they were trying to merge into their units. So we created this carve-out class. It's almost like a bit of an off-ramp, but what we found is that most teachers need the opportunity to do this work anyway, even if they're good at it, so we might as well put it in the learning progression as a course instead of just an off-ramp for people with struggle with the whole concept of content. So the first part of this course is going to be about how you find your content, what is your content, and then how you integrate it comes in the next piece, which is the outcome camp. It's a little challenging to do it this way, but what we have found is that people really need work time with support to figure out what is their macro content and what is their micro content. Remember that a lot of people were just handed textbooks in the past and that was their curriculum. So we're really making a dramatic shift away from a scope and sequence or a textbook and moving to this notion of the guaranteed and viable curriculum where a teacher can select different items, merge them together to make a unit that is personalized for a student. This is just one quarter or 25% and it's probably not even that because content, remember, is a vehicle for the development of the world-class outcomes and the other skills. There's really not a lot of long-term retention of just facts. However, what we do know are that kids who use content as a vehicle for skill development in an integrated and brain-friendly way retain it much longer than students that just simply memorize textbooks and give it back uh, on a bubble test. So the first part of this is going to be a bit of a formative assessment on curriculum after giving the participants a little bit of an introduction to what's the point of this class and what did they hope to have from it. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to ask teachers to circle items on the worksheet, if you will, that they believe are curriculum. This might seem remedial to you as a facilitator, but I want to tell you something. We have taught the outcome class, class many times, and what we learned right away is that not only do teachers struggle and leaders with the whole notion of what is content and what content should I teach, but they also struggle with the whole idea of curriculum. I think this is a problem we've created ourselves in education because so many districts are negligent in actually having a curriculum. So we want to make sure that teachers in our district know exactly what the curriculum is, where to find it, and its purpose. So we're going to start with a bit of a formative task. Again, you should have passed out to your teachers in the room the worksheet. I hate to call it that, but the reality is this is a quick temperature take of the room for you, and this is the best way to do it. We've done this multiple times and the best way to do it is to actually give them a list of items and have them discuss and circle the things their curriculum. Some people are going to circle everything on the list. You need to walk around and look at what your tables are doing and talking about. Make sure that you don't have a group that's so far off that you really need to off-ramp them with an, another activity. One of the activities we have used to off-ramp groups who are really struggling with the idea of curriculum is really taking a simple activity like riding a bike and having them break down the components of riding a bike or something like that. So walk around, see how your folks are doing. If people are circling everything on the list, then you know that you have a little work to do coaching this group forward. If they seem receptive, you don't have to do an off-ramp. You really have to make that decision for yourself. If the majority of the room are circling appropriate things, then you know that you're on the right track and you can keep going. So obviously the things that we want them to circle on the list are the four C's, the 21st century skills, content, what am I missing? Oh, the world-class outcomes. We also want them to perhaps circle the Colorado standards because the standards are the foundation that we built the world-class outcomes on. They also provide a bit of content guidance, particularly for elementary teachers. So circling that would be appropriate. What we do not want them to circle are things like worksheets, textbooks, and other items like that. 
Now the clear differentiation here is one set of items are goals or ends for students and one set of items are means. We don't want to get into the quality of the means. I mean, maybe we never want worksheets, but we don't talk about that here. That's not the point. The point is what items on the list are the goals for our students, the targets, the things that we want to make sure that every child leaves our classroom knowing and is able to do, and which items on the list have nothing to do with being a target or a goal. As you walk around, you might coach people. What do you notice about the things that you've circled first on the list? Try to get them to this whole idea of ends and means. Remember that in the filter class, we talk about ends being on the filter and means being things that we put through the filter. The same is true here because the items on the filter are the things we want for all kids, the targets, the things we want to commit to for our students in our schools. The same is true of curriculum. Another important part of this that you need to know is in a large district like ours, having a district curriculum is super important because we want to say to parents, and we do say to parents, it doesn't matter what school you choose, all children in this district will learn the GVC at an appropriate time and an appropriate way. So parents don't have to worry about choosing artful learning or choosing another school in the district like an IB school because their students will learn the same targets and outcomes as a student in a neighborhood school. That's an important part of a district this large and guaranteeing, which is why we call it the guaranteed and viable curriculum, guaranteeing all parents that no matter your choice, your child will get a quality education based on the right targets for kids in the 21st century. So having that information in the back of your mind is important because people are going to ask you questions along the way about why textbooks aren't the curriculum and why aren't the Colorado academic standards or the GLEs? Why aren't those the targets? And it's really important that you help them move from a place of textbooks are not the goal, they are a means to accomplishing a goal. And they're not the only means, they're a possible means that could be a choice if it makes sense for a student. So this is gonna be a pretty challenging part for this, but really we've noticed that as people start to get the idea of ends and means and goals for students, they move right through it pretty well. As you walk around the room, this really is important that you coach people forward. Ask them the right questions to get them there. Remember that their experience in education probably doesn't merge with the right answer. A lot of times in the history of our profession, the curriculum was the textbook. So it's not that people are necessarily not trained well, but, cer but certainly we've encouraged this kind of thinking by our lack of a quality curriculum in every district in the country. Another thing I want to mention is remember that Colorado is a local control state. Our Constitution is very specific about that and it says that our Board of Education sets the curriculum for our school district, something that we really embrace. It allows districts in Colorado to differentiate for their students. Now, what Denver decides is their curriculum, we support that, right? They know their students best, they know what they need, they lay out their curriculum. The same is true for us. So it's really important that people have a solid understanding as an educator or leader in this district, what is our curriculum, where did it come from, why do we have it, and why doesn't the state or national government have a set of uh, standards that are the curriculum? We really need to help people navigate through this so they have a solid foundational understanding that curriculum is locally determined goals and outcomes for students. And yes, we absolutely make sure that our curriculum takes care of the state standards. That's an expectation in this particular state. And because our state is a common core state, but who knows where that will be with the reauthorization of ESEA, but for now, Colorado is a common core state meaning that the Colorado Department of Education has integrated the Common Core into the Colorado Academic Standards and they're both in there. But for us, we took that information, we integrated them, we raised the rigor and made them better in our own curriculum. So make sure people aren't confused as you move through this. They don't need to teach the Colorado Standards and all the Douglas County curriculum because we've incorporated the, the Colorado stuff into our work and actually, in our view, made it a lot better. So that's good foundational information for you as you start this process. You're gonna bring your folks back together and you need to lead a Socratic discussion about what they chose and why. And you also need to get everybody to a common understanding of a word that they can use to figure out if something is curriculum. I generally try to work my class toward the idea of student goal. So when they say textbook, I can say, is it the goal? And often they say, well, no, of course not. The textbook is not the goal. Then they know that the textbook is not curriculum. 
We really have to get them there because in order for them to move into the next piece, which is the outcome matrix, that's where we're headed in outcome camp, they have to understand what our curriculum is and what it means to them. So the folks in your room should be creating their huge list of content. Some of them, your secondary folks, my experience, I'm not trying to be general, will have a really great, long, robust list. Sometimes elementary folks struggle with this a little bit more. We really need them to dig into, if I'm a second grade teacher, what are the mathematical concepts that I must cover with my second graders? They all have items that are on their list, whether they recognize it as content or not. The same is true for social studies, science, and language arts. The science can be tricky in elementary because a lot of them have put science on the exploratory wheel or as an elective. And they did that because early on science wasn't tested by the state. The problem with that is if they're not familiar with the science concepts, they're going to have less opportunities for integration when they get to their curriculum matrix. So you really want to encourage your elementary folks to explore all their different content areas and put down the key concepts. In fourth grade, Colorado history is a big topic of conversation. Make sure that they break that down into what about it? Otherwise, it's very difficult later for them to use that for integration. They teach Colorado history a long time and it's probably not a standalone unit if we're using best practices. So you're going to have to spend some time with your elementary folks. Point them in the right direction. Remind them that there is less content in elementary. And we know that and it's a good thing. And also acknowledge the fact that they spend a great deal of time teaching reading because that's really important in our early grades and we know that too. But we have to help them see that we shouldn't be teaching reading without any kind of grounded content that kids are interested in. And what they're going to find in the early grades is they have a lot of flexibility about what they use for the reading materials for kids. And as they get up in the intermediate grades, maybe there are a few more concepts that they're responsible to teach. And so it makes sense to allow kids to explore reading materials in those areas. But for reluctant readers, we know one thing is for sure. The more we allow them to choose things that make sense to them, the more they will learn how to read much faster and because they want to. With second graders who were offered the opportunity to explore anything they want, the reading levels that the students selected in the materials was much higher than the teacher would have given them. The same is true in sixth grade. We had sixth grade students who selected reading materials because of the project they were working on that were much higher than the teacher would have actually selected for them. This is good and we want this. So we want to encourage student voice and choice, particularly in the elementary grades as it relates to literacy. First graders at Coyote Creek who were exploring Legos read materials much higher than the teacher would have selected for them because that's the level it was written at for them to build a millennial falcon or whatever out of Legos. We want to encourage that so as the teachers struggle a little bit with the ambiguity of the content, remind them that that's a good thing because it allows for more student collaboration and more student voice and choice. The other thing that happens is primary teachers say that their students aren't capable of choosing materials and that's not true either. In Kathy Carter's class at Renaissance right here in Castle Rock, remember that her kindergartners designed the room from day one. Students are capable of far more than we ever thought possible and actually iPad touch technology has unlocked that for us for preschoolers who can't speak, can't write, and can't use a mouse. But we watch them doing high level cognitive tasks because of that touch technology. So encourage them to take risks and allow their students to explore more and decide more in their learning even if they're only five years old. Your secondary teachers will probably fly through this and that's great. Content is their thing. It's interesting because as we move forward with Outcome Camp, the thing switches and the elementary teachers are really good at the skill integration where the secondary teachers struggle with that a little bit more. So work with them on their lists really try to spend the time here getting the list right. Don't let them cop out and just choose 10 things and throw them down. If you do that, it's going to make outcome camp really difficult for them. You need to make sure that they have every single thing written down that they feel obligated to teach their students. 
so that we can navigate that with them in the next course as well as this one. The next piece of this work that we're going to do with them is to organize their lists into what they perceive to be macro concepts and micro concepts. And we're doing this because the minutia of the micro concepts gets in the way of unit design. If they're focusing on every spelling word and every vocabulary word and every little tiny detail that they want to make sure that they teach, they get lost in the forest. They can't get there. So we need to help them organize the, into bigger conceptual ideas that we call macro content. So make sure that as they're working through this, that they go and find what are their macro concepts, and then we're going to have them put their micro concepts underneath those. This part usually goes pretty well for most everybody who has a good list. People without a good list will not do well here at all. Just for your understanding, we've had teachers before on their content lists put English, math, social studies, and science. Those are not macro concepts. Those are simply content areas. Too high level. We need those to be divided more. And what we learned when working with that well-intended teacher was that she wasn't really sure what she was responsible to teach. We have to get through that piece with them here. This is the time to get it exactly right before they move into the next part of the course. The last part of this is the part that's the most difficult for people, so really spend time making sure that their list is solid. And if it looks too short, it probably is. If it looks too long, that's okay. They'll bring it down as they do the cards but make sure that they get the concepts of macro and micro. It's really important. Once they have those all laid out, when they go to integrate the skills and world-class outcomes, they will be far more successful. Here's the other thing that I hope will happen in the next course, and you might foreshadow it with some people who you're working with. We have a long history of teaching weather and geography and not together. So you're going to see grade levels where they teach, have weather on a card and all the concepts behind weather, and another one, geography, and all the concepts behind geography. When you see those kind of examples, and a light bulb goes on in your head, like, wow, weather has a lot to do with geography, maybe you should ask them about that, and they should explore that idea now. If they don't, it's okay, because they will in the next course. But too often, we see things that should be taught together as separate units, and they become the headers for those units. So weather, becomes the header for a unit, and geography. Unfortunately, we should be teaching those together because that's the way our students will learn it best. If they learn about geography and as a component of geography, how weather is influenced by geography, they will be far more apt to remember both ideas than if those are taught alone and independently. So encourage teachers as they're building their lists that they really think about the items that should go together we're going to be fighting some old mental models, some old paradigms, some things that we've done for a long time. You're going to have to encourage them to get up on the balcony and take a hard look at what they've taught and why they've taught it that way. Second grade, we have a whole thing about famous Americans. Help them try to get to the bigger idea behind that content. They feel responsible for teaching famous Americans. But I think that the bigger idea is how do famous people, famous people, shape the culture, et cetera, of an area, a country, a region, however you want to lay that down. But we need to help them think about content in a bigger sense before they go into this next class, and this is the time to do it. The individual coaching is the only way to approach this. Next, we're going to move into this final piece where we're going to review everything that we've done. An important part of this work is tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them, as they've experienced it. They should have uncovered, explored, and created all on their own. But it's important that we coach and facilitate in a way that helps them make sense of what they're doing and be very transparent about it. So the final piece of this is going to be the test tube piece. It's going to foreshadow the next class and then really reiterate what we've already worked on today so that they can see where it's going and how important the work they've done already is. Then finally, we need to revisit the hopes that they started the course with and make sure that we've met all their needs. If there's something on the list that you haven't met, then you need to ask them if you want them to do something more, if they want you to do something more to help them with that. Or if they say no, 
that probably wasn't for this class anyway, go ahead and scratch it off the list. But that decision needs to be completely theirs. We really value collaborating with students in this district and adults are no different. So we want to make sure that the course meets their needs. Then at the end, you probably need to revisit the learning progressions. What's next and why? I think people who are systems thinkers enjoy seeing the bigger picture and the road ahead. They don't like it very much when they can only see the little compartment that they're in. So show the learning progression course piece, show them what the options are for ahead, and also reiterate the help that we offer when they're back in their classroom. It's important that they know that this is not just a one and done. You come in, you do this, you leave, you're on your own. Absolutely not, and you've all been fantastic about offering that up time and time again. We need to make sure it's embedded in every course. Hopefully you have a really good sense of where people are in your room and you have made arrangements with those that are struggling to make sure that they get a little extra help. And those that have flown through it, I hope you've recommended that they go ahead and move on to the next class. The other thing that's really important is I hope that people in your room have a really strong sense that in Douglas County we don't believe in teacher proofing our systems. We don't believe that pacing guides and a scope and sequence is the right answer. Instead, we want to be more organic in our approach, giving teachers these outcomes on a PK through 12 continuum so that if they have kids operating up here, they can grab higher level outcomes. And if they have kids that are struggling in an area, they can move through it a little slower. In any case, we want to make sure teachers get the idea that the test tube is theirs to fill and to fill for each student or groups of students as they see appropriate. They are the coach, the facilitator, and the guide. But the opportunity to take these different components, take pieces of them, mix them together, and add student voice and choice as well as differentiation is our goal. The content is just one small piece. And for secondary teachers, this is an important topic of conversation. The more front work you do on this, the more prepared they are for the outcome camp and the better they'll do on their matrix. The other thing is, if they just philosophically don't agree with the concept, they're unlikely to take the next course. And that's okay too, they can work through that with the leader in their building. So the final piece of this is just a quick wrap up, congratulating the teachers on all the work they've done. This is hard work for many teachers, something they've never been asked to do before and something they've never even contemplated. For the secondary though, they know it pretty well. As long as they've organized it appropriately, they should be ready to go. I think that's about it except for make sure you paint the picture of the learning progression and where it goes from here for those that are systems thinkers and like to see the big picture. I'm like that. I don't want to wander along on a path bumping into greatness. I want to see the whole path and then I want to see the steps through it. And that's an important part for a lot of people in the room. So honor that preference. Make sure you talk about the big picture and where they can go from here.